Welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible study of First Baptist Church of Kimberling City. We hope you enjoy this Bible study and gain a deeper understanding of God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Jeff Hardy. Well, good evening, folks. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Kimberly City, our Wednesday night Bible study. We've been looking at Paul's letter to the church at Corinth and entitled this study, A Pastor's Heart, or From a Pastor's Heart, as Paul is writing there to the church who's going through some difficult times, is going through some turmoil, and he is writing to encourage them, not so much to correct them, but to encourage them and to authenticate his ministry. And the first few verses he was talking about, he didn't need, or chapters rather, he didn't need a resume, that Christ was a resume, and the Holy Spirit's work in them was all that he needed. And then beginning in chapter 2, about the middle of chapter 2, there is a pericope uh, scripture from 2, uh, 3 or so, all the way into 7, chapter 7, that Paul kind of takes on a different subject. And we're winding that up tonight. We're in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians in the first 10 verses. Uh, Paul, last week, we saw, was talking about reconciliation, how we uh, are reconciled to Christ and how we have the, the privilege of being uh, forgiven of our sins and being part of the family. Now, let's uh, begin in chapter 6, verse 1. And uh, we're going to talk, the first two verses Paul talks about uh, really, these verses really go with the previous verse or previous passage that Paul's talking about reconciliation and accepting reconciliation to Christ. So I want to pray with you and for you. And then I want us to look at these 10 verses tonight of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, you're so good to us. You've reconciled us through your son, Jesus Christ, when we didn't deserve it. Uh, when we couldn't earn it, but Father, through your grace, you provided salvation. Lord, I thank you for that and how it's available to all. And like Paul, he said, that is what um, motivates me to continue to share the gospel. Lord, give me that heart. Give me that zeal that Paul had that could withstand several uh, instances in his life that many of us would have quit. And Lord, I just pray that we would be stronger in our faith to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. All right, let me read these first couple of verses to you, and we'll talk about them for just a moment. But um, let, let's look what it says. It says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't hear the gospel message, and don't respond. He's saying, don't let it be in vain. Make it have purpose in your life. Make it mean, some, do something with it. Let it uh, drive you to respond. And Paul is asking him, do not let the grace of God um, be received in vain. He says, <clears throat> in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time, and behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul said it's, it's upon us, the day of salvation, the opportunity. Uh, when the gospel is shared, that is the day of salvation. That is the prime time for an individual to come to know Christ. I hear, I hear folks say sometimes, well, I'm just searching. And, and when I find what I'm looking for, I'll, I'll make that decision then. Folks, that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying when you hear the gospel message and the Holy Spirit begins to convict you of lostness or, or being unreconciled with God, it is time to respond. And, and make no doubts about it, no response is, is a response. A no response is the same as rejection. So Paul's telling us today is the day of salvation. Don't let it be in vain. Make it worth something. Now in verse 3, we see Paul is again describing his life and what he has been through to the church at Corinth. And really what he's doing is, uh, you know, there were Judaizers that came into the church and tried to discredit Paul that said what he was preaching was not true, was not real. 
And Paul wanted them to understand that he would not go through everything he went through if his faith was not secure and his belief was true in what he was preaching. So we're going to start with that and expound on it. It's funny that, that they thought Paul were, was nuts. They thought he was crazy. You know, we, we see all through the scripture that he is oftentimes described as being crazy with his Damascus Road experience, with his uh, changing from Saul to Paul and all of this. Um, in Acts chapter 26, 24, uh, Pilate says, or Festus says this to him, the governor, he says, Paul, you're mad. Your great learning is turning you mad. Uh, Paul considered it a compliment to be considered crazy. You know why? Because Jesus, in Matthew 12, 46, it says, He is beside Himself. He's crazy. Referring to Jesus. Paul thought that, or Paul took that that was a compliment. He was all in, folks. He was nuts about Christ. Uh, people say, well, you're nuts. Hey, our response is yes, but we're screwed on the right boat and that is Jesus Christ. Now, that being said, you know, we live in an area where there are some people who are nuts. <laughs> uh, we live in a country where there are some weirdos. We live in uh, a strange, strange place where people believe uh, that God is the trees, and they'll hug the trees, or God's in a chair, or, or God doesn't exist, and uh, people believe that. There, there's some strange people out there. But Paul here says, I am a fanatic for Christ. You know, we, we're fanatic over a lot of things. I, I'm very sad that college football may not play this fall. I was okay with COVID. I understood everything that was going on, but now it's getting too close to home. Because I'm fanatic. I love college football. Uh, I love to talk about it, but boy, I love to watch it, and I even love more to be there and present when it's happening. You know, Paul, while he may have been considered a fanatic, also knew what he was fanatical about. Charles Spurgeon said one time, he said... Uh, uh, about Paul, he said, if Paul was crazy, would that every man in London would be that crazy. He goes on to say that, that every one of us ought to be fanatic. This is Spurgeon speaking. Every one of us should be fanatical about Jesus as Paul was. So that being said, let's, let's look at verse 3. And Paul begins by showing how careful he is before men. Paul wanted nothing in his life to take away from his testimony and most of all, his uh, Savior. He didn't want anyone to have uh, the opportunity to criticize his testimony of what Jesus has done in life. Listen to verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. We give no offense in anything. And he's talking about in his ministry, <coughs> he is careful not to give any offense, let anyone be offended by what he's doing. Now, he's not talking about the gospel message. He's talking about his life, his lifestyle. Paul went to extremes not to taint or damage his character of being changed in Jesus Christ. We give no offense, offense in anything. You know, it's very important that you and I have the awareness of what others perceive. You know, anything in our life that causes others to stumble from receiving, now remember this is on reconciliation, from receiving the gospel message 
from responding to it in a positive way, if there's anything in our life that causes someone to do that, then we must take inventory of what we're doing. You know, Paul had people accuse him of being a deceiver, of being a phony, of being a false gospel, preaching a false gospel, being prideful, ambitious. Uh, people are always going to assume those things and find those. But Paul says, every one of those is false. We have took great care that our message and our lifestyle supports our message. We are changed. You know, this uh, made me think of the old uh, adage what, and the question throughout time, what about drinking, Pastor? Is it all right for me to drink alcohol? Is it okay for me to have a glass of wine with dinner? Is it okay for me this or for me to do that or for me to go here or there? You know, the Bible says that when we become a child of God, we are free. Nothing we do for us can counteract what Christ has done in us. But our lifestyle should, <coughs> should support or authenticate the change we're telling people we've experienced. Well, let, me, let me put it this way. There was a time not too long ago, maybe, well, maybe it has been a long time ago. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention was held in uh, Houston, Texas. We were there, we were going after the sessions, there was a, about a three hour break and we were going around Houston finding something there close to uh, where the convention center was. We were looking for something to eat as was maybe 12,000 other folks at the convention. <coughs> and we went into <coughs> a little side restaurant there on one of the streets. And I walked in and I saw some folks that I knew were from one of the Southern Baptist seminaries. I, I knew them, I recognized them. And we went by, I spoke, and they spoke. We went on to our seat, sat down. And when we sat down, I had an individual with me who was new in the faith. He said, Pastor, they've got a beer bottle on their table, they're drinking beer. And I said, yeah, they, they are. Well, pastor, that, that, I thought we couldn't drink beer. And it threw this young believer into a tailspin because he had been raised through the church that no, 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 no. And now he saw these believers, and they were, drinking beer at, at their dinner table. And then we went into a discussion. I said, you know, they're free to do that if they want to do that. However, if it causes someone to stumble, which it is you, they should be concerned and not do that. I had somebody say one time, I heard Johnny Hunt say, that's who it was. He said, you know, people ask me about drinking and I, I tell them that, you know, I can drink all I want to. I just don't want to because I don't want anything in my life to taint the testimony of what Christ has done and cause someone else to stumble. That's what Paul's saying. If you look at Paul's missionary tactics as he was going throughout Asia Minor, you see that Paul would go to, he didn't go in and just bash the synagogue. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he sat there and he listened. As was custom, at the end of the service, they would say, does anyone have anything to say? And when they would say that, Paul would stand up and said, yes, I do. And he began to tell his Damascus Road experience. And you know what? Some followed Paul. Some didn't. But Paul was very careful not to offend people by not attending on the Sabbath day when he was trying to plant churches throughout the country. So when he says we give no offense in anything, what he is saying is we have went to the extremes not to cause someone to question my ministry. 
Now, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes Christians do crazy things. I know uh, my seminary alma mater, the president of the seminary of the whole university, made a dumb, dumb move. And forgive me, but that's just what it was. It was dumb. He allowed pictures to be taken of himself in a provocative position on a boat at a party. And those pictures now, in the day and age we live in, you know if, if there's ever a photo taken, it lasts forever. That photo's surfaced. And I think he is a good man. I think he is a Christian man. But I also think he has eliminated himself from leading others at that university. Why? Because there will always be somebody in the wings say, hey, do you remember this? So Paul goes to, ex to extremes to tell us that there be no offense, nothing in our lifestyle that causes the gospel ministry to be hindered. Okay? You know, that's, that's why uh, a child of God needs to be careful what he watches, where she goes, what they do, because there's always someone watching you, and they're always watching you, waiting for you to fail, to do something perhaps that they have questioned with. So Paul says that, that we do nothing. Now, look at verse 4. Paul says... Um, in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Paul's talking about endurance. He's talking about... Here, here that word <coughs> actually means to be under pressure. To stay under pressure. Paul is saying that he stays under pressure. He does not quit. He is hanging in there for the ministry. In all things, no matter what comes, we commend ourselves or we hang in there as ministers of God. Now Paul's going to give some illustrations to follow that about these pressures that came against him and how he didn't quit. You know, I wish I could say that if I went through everything Paul went through, I wouldn't quit. I'd stay strong. But I don't know. It's amazing. His commitment, dedication, and fortitude that he went through. You know, we get our feelings all bent out of shape over some little something. But I want you to listen to some of these pressures that Paul felt. Look in uh, the next part of verse 4. He says, In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, and in distresses. Paul's talking about afflictions, distresses. What, what distresses you? What makes you unhappy? What makes you irritated? That's what Paul's talking about. These can be problems. They can be financial. They can be um, relationship. They can be disappointments. They can be physical illness, whatever it is. These are hardships that we face. Every person faces these hardships. Paul says here, he says, you know, these are things that come in life. These are things that you and I cannot help. You see, he says this, uh, he says, much patience in tribulation, in needs or in necessity. In other words, we can't help it. It's going to happen. It happens to us. You know, uh, it's things that we don't ask for, but they come our way. It's life. It's pressures that we under. It is a necessity we must face. It is, let's say, an elderly relative who is not able to stay by themselves and there's nobody else but you, and you must take care of them. That is a, a, a pressure of necessity that's laid on you. You didn't ask for it, nor would you neglect it. But it's something you have to do. It's something you have no control over. I was reading about Fanny Crosby 
last week, and I thought it would fit very good here. Uh, Fanny lived to be 95 years old. In case you don't know, she was blind. But she wrote some of the most powerful hymns that we have in the Christian faith. And she had a spirit that was amazing. Listen to what she wrote when she was eight years old. I think she was eight years old. It may have been nine, but it doesn't matter. She was a young child. She says, Oh, what a happy child I am. Although I cannot see, I am determined that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. What a powerful, powerful statement. It is the spirit that she had, that she knew she was blind, but yet she was not going to roll around in her sorrow. She was not going to have a pity party. She was going to celebrate and live life with that kind of attitude, a cheerful attitude. That's what Paul is doing here. He, he's talking about these calamities. He's talking about these things that come in distresses. These distresses he talks about are, in the Greek, it, it carries a word picture of being between a rock and a hard place. Narrow places. Places that press on us. Places that are hard to traverse. And places that we struggle with. This is what Paul's talking. These things we cannot, have, we cannot control, but we have to see them through. We have to endure through them. Don't give up. But then in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, in verse 5 of chapter 6, he says, In stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleepiness and in fastings. Now, verse 5 moves from the things that he cannot control to things that were brought against him in opposition. In other words, they were things that were physical on the outside that people who opposed him did. You know, he tells us that uh, on five occasions he was beaten 39 times, stripes. On five occasions. That's 195 stripes across the man's back with a stick or a stone, a stick with shards in it, 39 times. Or, excuse me, 39 Stripes five times, 195. He was stoned in the city of Lystra. He was left for dead. But you know what? He continued. I don't know that I could. I hope I could. And I hope I would. But Paul, these beatings were just a normal day for him. That was the opposition that he faced. But he continued. There were imprisonments, he says. <laughs> According to, the Clement of, or to Clement of Rome, who wrote just a few short years after Paul died, Paul had been imprisoned seven different times in his life. Now, we only have record biblically of three, but Clement of Rome said that seven different times he was in prison. He hung in there. There were mobs. There were sleepless nights. There were times when he was hungry and, and fasting and all of these things from the outside on him. But the key that Paul's trying to say that in all of these things, he didn't, he didn't quit. And the reason he didn't quit because he knew the gospel was real. He knew it was different. Now, how did he make it through this? Well, verse 6 tells us, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. These are things which Paul talks about of how he got through. And there are two divisions here. Um, the first four are qualities of Paul's life, the purity. Look at this. He gets through these things by purity. The first thing on his life is to remain pure, to remain honest. He lived in an immoral, immoral time. Sexual immorality was 
rampant. Uh, stealing, theft, deceive, all these things were impulsive. But he said, I strived in purity by knowledge. What does he mean by knowledge? He means a renewing of his mind. Each day he allowed his mind to be renewed, as in Romans 15, or excuse me, 12. Uh, the renewing of the mind. Paul <coughs> maintained the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. He says, by long suffering or forbearance. Paul had patience with people. <laughs> Paul exercised long suffering. He was willing to give people not just a second chance, but a third and fourth chance. Uh, an evangelist said this he said, There are a lot of people who I know are wonderful Christians. And I know they're going to heaven someday. I just wish they'd hurry up. <laughs> That's kind of our attitude with folks like that, isn't it? Sometimes we get that way. But Paul, he faced people that were in opposition to him, that was a burden to him, yet Paul was long-suffering toward him. Then he says there's kindness. Uh, that just simply means he was courteous. He was warm. He was cordial to him. He was willing to bury the hatchet, if that's what was. But he would never um, deliberately instigate an attitude of refusal towards somebody. He received everyone. He said he did this by the Holy Spirit. Now, without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to have these attributes as Paul talks about. It's impossible to maintain purity. It's impossible to, to renew the mind. It's impossible to be long-suffering, to be kind. These are things that Paul says comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. Paul is simply saying, these are the things that I clothe myself with, that we talk about the full armor of God, but he's saying, I can do these things because of the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and the left hand, his righteousness. So Paul is speaking about the weapons of righteousness that he has. Um, verse 8, we'll, we'll get on through these next couple of verses pretty quick. He says, By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not yet killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, and poor, yet making many rich, and having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Paul is drawing contrasts of what it appears, but what it is. Uh, what it appears to folks, but this is in case, this is the truth of it. Nobody could see, none of those in opposition to Paul who were unbelievers could see the, the benefits and the truth of remaining faithful and commitment in all things. You know, they thought Paul was dead in, in Lystra. They thought he was, it was over. But Paul lived his life in a ministry of reconciliation so the church at Corinth could hear his love for the Lord and for them. He was sharing from a pastor's heart. Hey, it's been good to be with you tonight, and I hope you've maybe had a glimmer of a new uh, food out of the Word of God, something that perhaps you had forgotten or perhaps you had overlooked, and you see that we got to hang in there, folks. We live in a desperate time, in a critical time, a time where the church is needed as much as ever before. And by the church, I'm saying you and I, believers in Christ. 
We've got to put, put aside our differences. Put aside our petty griefs, our offenses. And we must glory in the Lord Jesus. Hey, may God bless you. May he be with you. Hope we see you this Sunday at First Baptist Church, life groups at 9 o'clock, and then worship at 10. But until then, may God shine his face upon you in Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining our weekly Bible study. Remember to tap like and share to help spread God's word. If you have any questions about this study or about our church, please contact us through social media or through our website at fbckc.com. God bless you and have a good night.